Per usual, let me tell you about the purple channel, Roanoke Games. I'm about to exclusively start streaming over there, as long as I don't get banned by a deer human. So if you want to come watch, link is in the description. As humans have evolved on Earth, we went from being a mid-tier predator reliant upon the safety of treetops to the apex species on the planet capable of really having no naturally occurring predators in a relatively short amount of time, concerning geological timescale. The day our ancestors decide to pick up a rock and hurl it, the other predators around us were Basically like, no, you can't just destroy our evolutionary race and make claws and teeth useless. To which we responded, haha, rock and club go smash. Now that I have affirmed I am part of the cool kids club concerning memes, this is actually the reality. Human intelligence allowed for us, the nerds of the animal kingdom, to develop artificial power, allowing us to overcome every other species. And unless we are caught out in the open with our guard down and no way to defend ourselves, the only real animal that we have to worry about are other humans. Enjoying the most pronounced version of this protection, a group of parents military soldiers, likely in a form of special forces, or really mercenaries, were sent into the jungle to rescue humans from other humans. While there, however, they end up running across a predator species known as the Yacha, which are larger, stronger, and more deadly than any other human. So in today's episode, we will be talking about the predator from the 1987 movie Predator. I make this designation because there have been a lot more predators to come to light since time has kind of, you know, passed, which we will discuss their specific morphology as a subspecies, and where they appear to have arisen from since the Yacha initially left their home planet. So let's get to the lore and morphology of this absolute beast of an animal and find out how it was able to overcome all but one in this episode. So we have probably all seen Predator. It's essentially one of the best movies out there concerning aliens hunting humans, in my personal opinion. But in case you would like a quick summarization, then you know that we got to do that. If you want to skip past that point, I'll put a timestamp up on screen. So head to that point to get to the biology. But all right, I'm gonna drop you into it. From the beginning, we start out with the arrival of Dutch and his team in the jungles of Guatemala. Told by Dylan, a former friend and ally, that the cabinet members and senators have been taken hostage by a group of militant guerrilla fighters, they are to be dropped into the jungle jungle by helicopters and basically told good luck. While moving through the jungle, they stumble across the remains of a US Special Forces group or Green Berets. Flayed down to their skeletons, it's clear that they are dealing with some bad dudes, but seeing as this looks more ceremonial in how they were found, the team is confused and disgusted by what they see. Continuing with their mission, they eventually find a group of gorillas deep within the jungle thanks to Dylan's information. After witnessing one of the hostages being taken out, Dutch orders the team into position so they can begin their attack. Being the sexual tyrannosaurus that Dutch is, he straps some C4 to the running truck, creating power, and then drops it off its blocks. It runs into the camp, and the raid is underway. Once finished, it becomes clear that there are no senators or hostages anymore. Dutch confronts Dylan, and is told that they were set up to get them out there so that they could retrieve this intel. He is told that in a few days, this would be over the border and would be out of their reach. Their mission was also to retrieve the military operatives, however, but they were all ended before they could get rescued, so the mission was only only a partial success. And this is also much to the dismay of Dutch, considering that he actually knew some of these people personally. After the conclusion of the raid, a girl named Anna was captured, who was the final remaining gorilla, and decided to keep her alive to get information so they would take her back to the extraction point. After they leave, we get our first look at the predator's hand, as we see it picks up a scorpion and examines it using thermal image. As they move through the forest, things begin to quickly happen. Hawkins is the first to go, as he is stabbed by the predator's arm blade and picked up into the trees, where he is hung upside down for later trophy acquisition. While searching for Hawkins, Blaine goes out into the jungle where he finds an animal moving across the ground. He turns his back on what he thinks is safe, but then is hit with a plasma bolt center mass, which blows out his spine, lungs, heart, and rib cage, ending him instantly. Enraged by the fall of his friend, Mac initiates a firefight with the creature and ends up wounding it. This causes it to bleed with a fluorescent green blood. After injuring it, the creature runs off to begin suturing and tending to its wounds, showing that the animal is clearly not of this planet. Dutch still believes that the gorillas are responsible, but Billy is adamant that the perpetrator is not human and is met with skepticism. As night falls, the group decides to make a camp and then set up traps along their campsite to ward off whatever is out there. As some of the traps are set off, Mac ends up taking out a wild pig by mistake, believing that it is actually the creature. Predator then comes in to attack the group and then takes Blaine's body, utilizing the confusion brought on by the pig. Dutch then realizes that it is using the trees to travel, which has completely negated their perimeter traps. Attempting to catch the creature with a net the next day, it ultimately and momentarily succeeds, but during this point, the creature is able to escape, injuring Poncho in the process. As it runs off, Mac and Dylan go after it. Mac crawls through some underbrush before being spotted by the creature and having his brain case pretty much caved in by a plasma bolt. Dylan is left alone in his pursuit,
suit, which would spell his undoing as a plasma bolt severs his arm. Turning around in one final act of defiance using his other arm that's still intact, Dylan attempts to take out the creature, but due to its speed, it is able to get in close with a stab. It lifts Dylan up in the air, and then he meets his end as well. With the group dwindling, the remaining members make a break for the extrication site. During this, Billy decides that it's probably a good idea to square up on this thing, and removes his handheld, brandishing only a machete. Only moments later, a scream is heard, marking his end, and then shortly after that, Poncho is then ultimately ended. The Predator would go on to wound Dutch, and before Anna could pick up a handheld and fire upon the creature, Dutch kicks it out of her hand, as he understands only attacking this thing means that you're deemed a challenge. And considering Anna has been unarmed, Dutch then orders her to get to the chopper so that she can be extricated. I know, my Arnold Schwarzenegger accent is completely on point. The Predator then pursues Dutch into a river where the cloaking device is interrupted by the waters overwhelming the circuitry. As Dutch is dropped from the waterfall, he climbs back onto shore. He enters an extremely muddy part of this area that completely coats him. The Predator then approaches the area that Dutch is in, but doesn't seem to be able to spot his heat signature due to this encasing of mud. Realizing that this can be used as camouflage, Dutch begins to craft traps and offensive measures. All the while, the Predator continues to collect its trophies from the mercenaries it had taken out and that had fallen. Dutch lets out a yell to lure the creature back in and starts to fire as the final battle begins between human and alien. Dutch disables the creature's cloaking device and inflicts minor injuries, but then falls into the river, losing his mud, and then is pinned by this creature. The Predator recognizes that Dutch is a much more worthy opponent, and due to its honor-bound nature, discards its mask and plasma caster. A hand-to-hand -hand fight ensues, but it becomes quickly apparent that even though Dutch is an absolute monster himself, the being from another planet is much stronger and much more resilient. Or is it from another planet? We'll get to that soon. Severely injured, Dutch retreats back to a fallback point, which is booby-trapped. Upon the Predator entering the burrow to finally finish off Dutch, it ignores his taunts of, Come on, kill me, I'm right here! After it finds a sharp protrusion above its head, thinking it's found one of his traps, it walks around the other side. Dutch then manages to crush the creature using the trap's counterweight, picking up a rock to continue the fight. It's apparent the Predator has been bested, but the Predator does not want its technology to fall into the hands of humans and just basically rage quits. Activating its nuclear option, it detonates the device in its forearm. Prior to this, it begins laughing maniacally as Dutch takes off trying to get out of the blast radius. After it self-destructs, the helicopter shows up to take Dutch away, who's beaten and dispirited, but alive. So, all caught up in how the aliens just completely murk us. All right, good. So let's get into that sweet, sweet morphology because the origins of this species make sense considering how they appear and evolved on their home planet. So the first thing that should be known about the Yacha species is that it's very old. There is some evidence-based origin and a speculative one, and from this we can kind of gather its age. The speculative one should likely be discounted, but it is interesting nonetheless. So the Yacha body is one designed to breathe a similar atmosphere to that of humans, but is different to some degree. The Yacha prefer atmospheres of 1% more oxygen and 4% more nitrogen. This may actually explain their strength to a degree as well, but we will get to that in a moment. And it also might explain the blood we see. So considering their blood is green in color, I would have to assume that unlike us, their blood is copper-based. Copper is not as efficient at carrying oxygen as iron is concerning hemoglobin connections with oxygen, but it is still entirely a viable option for an evolving species. In fact, a lot of animals on Earth have copper-based blood. Mollusks have been known to have this evolutionary trait, but more interestingly, arthropods in particular. Why is this interesting? Well, let's get into an overall look of this creature. An average Yacha is an imposing monster, standing roughly 2 to 2.8 meters, or 6.5 to 9 feet tall. These animals tower over humans, who average between 5 foot 8 and 6 foot 4, with outliers on both sides. A Yacha is also built like a dump truck. This creature is covered with muscle and very little fat due to primarily its diet and lifestyle. A predator is essentially a nomadic creature going from system to system hunting the most dangerous creatures as a rite of passage. The Yacha are also known to be omnivorous, although it is not seen in the Predator movie. The face and body of a Yacha appear to be a blending of creatures. So on this planet, insects were first concerning complex multicellular organisms. These insects existed in the water for the most part, but as time progressed, some turned into fish, while others kind of just crawled out of the water. There was a time in Earth's history where the atmosphere had more oxygen, and during this point, massive arthropods hunted lizards. Eventually, as oxygen waned, this would cause the opposite to take place, as what tends to happen in an evolutionary race. But looking at the Yacha, it appears to be like both. The skin of a Yacha is scaly. The hide is extremely thick, able to withstand wounds that would outright end a human. It bleeds a green color and is able to be sutured quickly. The skin is also apparently acting as a way to take in heat. Meta
metabolically due to the skin and preference of the Yacha to seek out warmer areas and its ability to resist extreme heat such as boiling water, the Yacha likely evolved on a planet that was extremely warm, if not scorching. This may mean that the creature is somewhat cold-blooded, much like a reptile on Earth. So in the immortalized words of Dutch, the Yacha is one ugly motherfucker. Because when it removes its mask, we get a good look at what it looks like. And I gotta tell you, I agree with Dutch. The mandibles on this face look like that of arthropods. And for some reason, on each side of their face, these hinge heads can open up a portion for seemingly some unknown reason. Now, it may have been a specific type of animal they could have eaten from an evolutionary standpoint that they needed these extra set of mandibles, but for any other situation, it doesn't seem necessary. A regular mouth with fangs can be seen, showing that yes, they do in fact eat meat and probably the prey that they eventually take out. The Acha also internally have an ability that may seem strange, but it actually is just a form of sight like you or I. This creature has its own version of sight, which helped it hunt down prey. Behind its yellow or green eyes, it typically will be the morphological trait of a Yacha. It seems that a red-like infrared coloring is how they view the world. Able to detect the body heat of animals, this is their main view. Now, likely on a superheated planet, other creatures would have a cooler body temperature, so they would appear kind of more blue or black in its field of view, and everything around it would appear red, which makes sense why in the jungle, if it's 98 degrees and humans are 98 degrees, it does actually have some issues spotting humans under those conditions. But the mask that the Yacha wears kind of gets around this issue by giving it infrared sight all the way up to ultraviolet. But once removed, it becomes much less able to block out the surrounding heat of the jungle to see humans. Now, infrared sounds pretty odd, right? Well, snakes, blood-sucking insects, fish, frogs, all can actually see in infrared. And it's interesting that both of these variants are either reptiles or insects, isn't it? Coincidence? I think not. On top of the head exists what appears to be dreadlocks, but in reality, these are sensory organs. These organs are actually rooted in Yacha culture. As they grow, adornments are added, which can be extremely painful. And because of this, I can only assume that these organs are sensitive to pressure changes within the environment and are used to almost feel around them due to airwaves. But what do these dreadlocks report to? Well, the brain, obviously. The intelligence of a Yacha, as to be expected, is quite pronounced. Due to the trials and tribulations on their own planet as they evolved, possibly under more extreme conditions than that of Earth, this means they may have been tested more than humanity was. This led to the strongest and most intelligent to survive. Their written language appears to be a system of dashes, but this has apparently served them well considering they achieved spaceflight and have interacted with humans in the past, which will be discussed in its own episode. But what is intelligence if the brain case and body are fragile? The skeletal structuring coupled with the musculature of the Yacha is staggering. Not only are the bones longer, leading to more a biomechanical force being able to be imparted, but the muscular connections and thickness of the bone themselves allow for the Yacha to pull some interesting feats. The muscle mass on the body allows for the Yacha to jump three times its height and climb as if it were not currently being affected by gravity of the planet that it's on. This muscular strength likely stems from the higher oxygen levels the body usually enjoys. With more oxygen, even with less efficient methods at carrying that oxygen, this would mean that the muscles could grow larger and contract harder. This over time would have led to thicker bones to accommodate this growing muscle mass. But what does this boil down to? Well, during the fight with Dutch, Dutch might as well have been fighting like three of himself. The bones are strong enough to handle the Yacha jumping down from heights over 10 times itself and weighing 250 to 350 pounds or 113 to 159 kilograms, this is thousands if not hundreds of thousands of newtons of force. This would pulverize human bone and snap them like twigs, yet the Yacha regularly operates under these conditions and does combat with much more lethal animals than Homo sapiens basically just gonna beat the living crap out of us. Essentially the Yacha is a creature that if you took all human strengths and none of the weaknesses and then multiplied it by like a hundred, you would get them. These strengths have made them the dominant life form that humanity knows of so far and even in groups, brief encounters outnumbering this creature, this alien is able to outmaneuver and outmatch any well-conditioned human. But how did it get like this then? Well, there are two main lines of thought as to where the Yacha originate from. The first is more evidence-based due to their physiology, and the other is more speculative, but also has a chance of being correct under the right conditions. So I know I just said the first, but starting with the latter, let's start by saying this. Earth is old. Sometimes we don't realize that this rock has been around for 4.5 billion years, give or take a few hundred million, and you can't even really conceptualize that much time. It's actually impossible for humans to see that number and understand it. There's actually a uh, video on it's okay to be smart. They did the, basically a timeline of the planet by pulling a giant piece of string and then showing where markers were along the way. I would absolutely recommend going and checking that out because it'll kind of give you an idea just how old this planet is. But we also 
like to think, apart from all that, that we are the only sapient creature that's been on this planet. But then the question is, how would we even know if there was some a few million years ago? Looking at human structures from even a few hundred years ago, there is almost nothing but rubble due to the weathering of time. And this is potentially the origins of the Yacha. The idea goes that they originated from Earth hundreds of millions of years ago, and possibly even perhaps billions. Around the same time insects and reptiles were battling each other for survival, or I guess I should really say amphibians were battling each other for survival, a species arose on Earth that was strong and violent. Through trial and error, much like humans, they clawed their way up to become the dominant species. That said, they wouldn't stick around on Earth, and there are two hypotheses as to why. The first is that the Yacha were picked up by a superior species that was already spacefaring at this point due to their potential, or at least seeing their potential. The species would be trained and brought into the fold and given technology which may explain their tribal nature, even now, yet access to monumental technology. This line of thinking is interesting as it would put them squarely into the era where Earth was stifling but had high oxygen content. It would also put them around the era where it's possible that the insects and amphibians still had a living relative as a missing link, which they may have actually ended up being. The second thinking is considering they arose so long ago, the species progressed, formed their own space program, and continued to advance. Eventually there were no more challenges on Earth, so they left to hunt the cosmos for bigger game. A species like this would have to be used to this challenges considering that the giant beasts like dinosaurs were roaming the planet depending on how long they stayed on Earth for. This would also explain their physical toughness as if they weren't imposing or able to survive, they would have been eaten. And another strange thing to note about the possibility of all of this is that females of this species do actually produce milk, meaning there appears to be some mammalian traits as well. And this may also explain their fixation on Earth as a target, seeing as it used to be the old stomping grounds and now another species has evolved to live there. The second assumption, which was the first one I mentioned, is that, and this one makes a little more sense to me personally, despite them sharing characteristics with species of this planet and being carbon-based life forms themselves, this is not to say that this couldn't have happened on other planets, meaning that they have come from other planets. The planet the Yacha appear to be from is known as Yacha Prime. Yacha Prime is an unforgiving, rocky planet with very little vegetation. To boot, the climate is extremely hot, which may be why the Yacha also prefer to hunt in warmer climates of Earth. The atmosphere is similar in composition to Earth with a little more oxygen and nitrogen. This would indicate that carbon-based life forms could form there much like on Earth. Wherever they came from, whether it be from a more primitive Earth or from another planet entirely, this has led to a creature that is much stronger and older than humanity. Ultimately, this means that humans will likely remain prey for these creatures despite the sapient intellect humans have, or at least until we actually like start creating Spartans to combat the hinge heads. Wait, don't we already do that? Well, I want to thank you guys for watching. I hope everyone enjoyed. If you did, leaving a like would be great, and if you want to share this, that would also be cool because my videos have been getting screwed to the wall again. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Twitch, and channel links in the description, and I recently made a video about walking corpse syndrome on Croto and Medical, if that sounds interesting. But apart from that, I would like to thank my patrons real quick. Huge shout out to our astronaut, Trey Windenall. Thank you for your support, bro. And next up, I want to thank our scientist, Skilt, and our residents, James Wiley, Niley, that's probably not the way to say that, Robert Plattner, Some Red Dude, and Vincent Garcia. I also want to thank the rest of my patrons because y'all are keeping the dream alive, and I really do appreciate it. All right, so that does it for me. Thanks for watching, and I will see y'all in the next one.